Okay, sergeants, if you can begin your uh, recordings. PC recording is up. Cloud recording is started. Backup is rolling. Mr. Bradley, thank you. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council's hearing on small businesses. At this time, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. You may begin, Chair. Thank you, Sergeant. Good morning. I am Council Member Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing today on two bills, intros 2097 and 2110, that will help increase awareness and financial resources for small business owners to comply with Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In 1990, George Bush signed into law the Americans with Disability Act, commonly known as the ADA, a historic piece of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination against individuals under Title III of the ADA. Businesses that provide goods or services to the public are required to construct or adjust their physical space policies and procedures to ensure that the people with disabilities have full and equal enjoyment of those goods and services. New York State Human Rights Law and New York City Human Rights Law further expanded the protection of the ADA office to individuals with disabilities, including offering protections to certain temporary disabilities not covered under the ADA. Perhaps because small businesses are unaware of the regulations that they must comply with, or because business owners do not have the financial wherewithal to pay for the ADA alterations to their spaces, independently owned businesses have had difficulties complying with aspects of ADA. According to Wellington Chen, Executive Director of the Chinatown Bid, Old and narrow sidewalks in Chinatown and language access challenge has made it difficult for local immigrant business owners to comply with the ADA regulations. Adhering to ADA requirements may be especially challenging for business owners lacking experience or educational resources about the ADA. ADA standards can be found in a number of places, including the federal statute, federal regulations, Implementing the law, technical manuals and Department of Justice settlement agreements, the average small business owner may simply not have the knowledge of the legal system to understand the various regulations with which they must comply. Because certain small businesses may not be in compliance with all aspects of the ADA, many small businesses have been vulnerable to lawsuits for non-compliance. Attorneys, will sometimes file lawsuits against hundreds of small business owners and the plaintiff's attorneys typically seek to settle these cases where they're able to recover legal fees. In 2016, the average settlement for the ADA Title III lawsuits was 16,000, a significant unexpected cost for a small business owner. Because attorneys can make a significant amount of money through these lawsuits, the number of lawsuits against small businesses for non-compliance with Title III of the ADA has drastically risen in recent years. According to testimony submitted by the Lawsuit Reform Alliance, New York is second in the nation in terms of the number of ADA non-compliance lawsuits. In New York State, the number of cases increased from 543 cases in 2016 to over 2,600 in 2019. In 2020, despite the many businesses being closed due to COVID-19 pandemic, plaintiff's attorneys still filed 2,238 such suits in the New York federal courts. Nationally, 
over 1,100 cases were filed in January of 2021, the highest number of cases ever filed in a single month. I was glad to see in November of 2019 that SBS, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, the New York City Good Association, and Public Policy Lab launched Empowering Accessibility, an online resource guide to enable small business owners to more easily understand their obligations under the ADA. Empowering Accessibility offers resources tailored to new and existing businesses and information on how to deal with the ADA variety of lawsuits. Nonetheless, these bills we're hearing in the committee today will offer further necessary protections to small business owners, which will help ensure that they are both aware of the regulations that they must comply with and have the city funded resources to make the necessary ADA alterations. With that said, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, legislative aide, Austin Sackler, our legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, our policy analyst, Noah Mikesler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Member Kalos, Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Brooks Powers, who this is her first hearing uh, in small business. I'm excited to have her, and I'm sure we're going to be joined by other colleagues as the hearing continues. I want to turn it over to Council Member Kalos, who's the prime sponsor of the legislation we're hearing today to deliver an opening statement. Council Member? Thank you, Chair Jonai, for your leadership on small businesses uh, since before the pandemic and ever more so since then. The blight of empty storefronts has only gotten worse since the pandemic, and we need to do everything we can to help them retrofit for accessibility and public health to welcome more customers with disabilities while securing lower rents. It's a win-win-win for small business owners, customers susceptible to coronavirus or with disabilities, and even landlords. Mom and pop stores are the small businesses that make New York City great, that have remained inaccessible to 1 million residents and 7 million tourists with disabilities. These mom and pop storefronts have been the target of Americans with Disability Act lawsuits filed growing year over year, both nationally and locally. Recent reporting shows that the number of such cases in New York surged more than 300% from 543 in 2016 to 2,338 last year. A number of these cases were filed by frequent flyer serial litigants who specialize in these types of drive-by lawsuits. Small businesses are particularly vulnerable to these types of suits because they have less income to spend making ADA alterations to their spaces and less to spend on legal counsel. The worst part is that many of these lawsuits are settles, settled, costing mom and pop owners the money they could have spent staying open or making the accessibility improvements that are rarely required by these settlements or even or ever happen. Their first bill, Introduction 2097, would create an accessibility fund for small businesses. The fund would make grants and loans of up to $250,000 available to any small business, 100 employees or less, for the purposes of renovating existing storefronts to become ADA compliant. The grants or low interest loans would be made available to either the building owner or the storefront lessee. In either case, the commissioner could require an agreement between the landlord and tenant to a decrease in rent in proportion to the size of the grant in return for these permanent improvements. In the second bill, Introduction 2110, I would provide training and education to small businesses on compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. The bill would make available information for all small businesses on various requirements under the ADA and would update whenever there are any changes to the current guidelines. The bill would also help business owners complete a detailed survey of their commercial property or business website to determine improvements suggested or required in accordance with the ADA. Both bills would help to curb the onslaught of vexatious litigation against the most vulnerable business owners. It's good to see Wellington Chen of the Chinatown Partnership, whom I joined along with aging chair Margaret Chen, to discuss innovations to make businesses in Chinatown accessible. I hope that this legislation would help. Again, I want to thank our small business chair, Mark Jonai, for hearing these two important bills. I'd also like to thank Victor Kalise, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office 
for people with disabilities for working with me on this program since I was elected. Together, we can open up the best parts of our city for everyone. One piece I'm curious about whether we can, I'm looking for improvements to this legislation. One question is whether or not we could add a right to renewal in addition to reduction in rent as part of this. Uh, I also wanna recognize that I, I do see our council member, Helen Rosenthal, who is a leader on uh, disabilities legislation uh, has passed so much and it's always a pleasure to work with her on this and everything else. And finally, I'd like to thank a former colleague, council member Andy Cohen for his work on these bills while he was at the council. Uh, we actually had a, a we, we actually had to fight over who got which bill, uh, but either way, I'm gonna be proud to help carry these bills over the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, council member, um, for that uh, opening statement. And you're absolutely right. This is about not only protecting small businesses, but also protecting and enriching the lives of those that are, so, that are disabled. Um, so I'm grateful to you for this uh, legislation that you proposed in this hearing. Now let me turn it over to um, Stephanie Jones for some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I'm Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Committee on Small Business, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we'll be inviting testimony from the Department of Small Business Services and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. For all panelists, when called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Blaze Backer, Deputy Commissioner for the Neighborhood Development Division of the Department of Small Business Services. We will also be joined for questions by the following representatives from the administration. Amna Malik, Assistant Commissioner of Business Operations and Regulatory Reform from the Department of Small Business Services. Phil Monaco, Executive Director of Accessibility at the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities. And Ed Friedman, Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs Coordinator for the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Backer? I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Malik? I do. Thank you. Executive Director Monaco? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Friedman? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Deputy Commissioner Backer to present his testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Joe and members of the Committee of Small Businesses uh, on Small Business and City Council. I am Michael Blaze Backer, Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Development at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I am joined by my colleague, Assistant Commissioner Amna Malik, and from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, Edward Friedman and Phil Monaco. At SBS, we aim to ec unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I am pleased to testify in the proposed bills, introductions 2097 and 2110, and SBS's efforts to support small businesses in creating greater access to the disability community and navigating accessibility compliance issues. New York City small businesses collectively create a vital and essential infrastructure for the people that inhabit and visit the city. This includes the roughly 1 million New Yorkers who have a self-disclosed disability and the approximately seven to 9 million tourists with disabilities who visit New York City each year. Creating access to our small businesses is essential to equity for people with disabilities who have faced centuries of physical and attitudinal barriers. It is also essential for thriving businesses and building stronger communities of which the disability community is an integral part. In 1990, the landmark Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, and since then we have come a long way, but there is still work to be done. At SBS, we recognize the need to provide adequate access for people with disabilities and the challenges that small businesses face when meeting their legal obligations under federal, state, and local law. 
In 2019, SBS provided resources to the Avenue NYC grant program to the NYC Bid Association and Public Policy Lab and partnered with MOPD to provide support to, small business, to the small business community. The goal of the project was to create greater access to the city's small businesses by supporting better understanding of and compliance with accessibility requirements, leading to fewer penalties for New York City businesses. The stakeholders took a deep dive into compliance requirements and mapped out the different challenges that a business owner may potentially face. The result was the creation of the Empowering Accessibility Report and the launch of a digital resource platform at www.businessaccessibility.nyc. These resources provide information for all business owners, whether they are in the process of opening a business, operating an existing business, or responding to an accessibility issue. The digital platform includes information on the benefits of making a business accessible, physical and digital accessibility standards, the risks of accessibility lawsuits, and additional resources. It also includes a step-by-step -step navigation materials for businesses translated into 12 languages. Additionally, in 2019, MOPD and SBS conducted an in-person and digital accessibility training for representatives from bids across the city to highlight the empowering accessibility tools and ensure that bids are aware of accessibility obligations when supporting their neighborhood businesses. The premise of this work and the resources created are in line with the spirit of intro 2010, 2110, sorry. SBS compliance advisors meet with businesses regularly to address various compliance questions and needs. Intro 2110 would build on these existing education and training efforts. With regards to Introduction 2097, the city is firmly committed to providing small businesses with information to help them better understand their legal obligations under the ADA and related laws. We look forward to a continued conversation with the council on how to ensure that small businesses are supported as they seek to comply with their accessibility mandates. SBS believes increased accessibility is not only a civil right, but also makes good business sense. The disability community must have access to the small businesses and restaurants that play a critical role in our economy and cultural life. We also believe that any business that is fully inclusive of people with disabilities at the consumer and employment levels has an increased return on investment for themselves and the city. Educating small business owners about accessibility mandates so that they are inclusive for all New Yorkers and visitors with disabilities is vitally important. The city remains firmly committed to providing educational materials that inform business owners on laws requiring accessibility for people with disabilities. We look forward to working with the council and the business and disability communities to ensure the New York City is accessible to all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Jonai. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you very much for that testimony, uh, Deputy Commissioner Backer. You've indicated that the resources that you provide are out in several languages, which is always a barrier. Um, how else can SBS help further educate our small businesses on the ADA compliance? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, we, you know, again, we're thankful for your interest in this, in this issue. It's one that certainly the SBS takes quite seriously. And, and as you touched on um, in, your, in your opening statement and that I touched on on, on this, this resource that we created with the bids, you know, really was a step in that direction. So we, of course, at SBS have our, um, you know, our small business advocates and our compliance advisors, um, as well as our small business hotline that we created in response to the pandemic. And, and those are really, you know, the first touch point for many businesses to reach us. Um, they obviously many know of MOPD and might reach out to them directly, but certainly we take, you know, take the, the in kind of the first hit and, and sort of ensuring that businesses know of this issue, that they know what their um, requirements are. And, and again, we mostly will direct them to um, the uh, businessaccessibility.nyc website because it is quite comprehensive and provides, again, as you touched on the, you know, the sort of these resources in 12 languages. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, I see Wellington on here, you know, Wellington was a key, um, you know, he not only the bid association as a whole, but he himself um, and the Chinatown bid along with um, two other colleagues of his, um, uh, Michael Brady, as you know, in Third, Third Avenue in the Bronx, 
um, and Marcus Serta and Park Slope Fifth Avenue essentially served as kind of guinea pigs as, as, as they collaborated in creating these resources to ensure that this was a tool that was usable, that really incorporated the, the input of the, uh, the disability community as well as small business owners and the biz themselves. So um, they kind of tested it, uh, we refined it, um, and, and I think we're really happy with uh, how it turned out. And, and, and essentially we, need, we continue to ensure that bids are aware of it and use it as a resource when they're out in their communities talking to businesses. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, intro 2097 would require the city to provide a program that provides loans and grants, uh, in-kind services or in-kind materials to small businesses where there are 100 employees or less to make their properties more accessible. Uh, loans and grants up to a uh, total of 250,000 for participants. Is that enough in your experience and uh, the feedback that you're getting, Deputy? The, the 250,000 amount? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, the range, the cost range certainly to make ADA improvements, I think is, uh, you know, probably as, as dramatic and considerable as any, any renovations a business might make to their property. So I, I don't have, a, you know, I don't really know. Um, what sort of the average cost might be to make those improvements. Um, uh, I would say, you know, again, as you know, right, a storefront might, you know, just have to put in a ramp or, or you know, widen its entryway, or it might need to put in sort of make more substantial improvements. So I think the range is, is considerable. Um, I mean, to me, I think 250,000 for uh, accessibility alone um, sounds um, considerably quite high. I think, you know, from, from our experience, um, um, you know, a business might be spending that amount of money, certainly in a build out, but uh, I don't think the majority of those costs are going specifically to ADA accessibility. Thank you, uh, Deputy. Um, those loans uh, for the storefronts and uh, accessibility, are they personally guaranteed by the small business owner? Um, which loans, I'm sorry? The, the, the 250,000 up to uh, loan, is that a personal guarantee? by the uh, small business owner? So the, the loans as discussed in the, in the bill. Um, but we currently have storefront loans, correct? And that's part of the program that we have that um, they can invest in accessibility. So you're and talking about loans that? in general, personally guaranteed or not? Um, I'm going to, I'm not entirely sure what the, the, the loans that are already in place. Of course, there's sort of a, a wide variety of loans and, and CDFIs that we work with to make, um, you know, make financing available to small businesses. Um, my colleague, Amna Malik, uh, may have a better answer for you. Amna. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, the LMI Storefront Loan Program does um, have a personal guarantee, um, but for we're open to working with council to understand the needs and think about what the loan that's being proposed and what small businesses need to think about how we can um, prepare that. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. And that's my concern, uh, Deputy uh, Backer, that the loan, the loans that will be provided for will come with personal guarantees to these sm struggling small businesses. Uh, and coming out of this pandemic and crisis, uh, burdening our small businesses with additional loans that have to be paid with interest on top of that with personal guarantees can be a burden that our small businesses will not take advantage of, will not further put themselves in debt and their livelihoods and personal properties that uh, would otherwise be protected without a personal guarantee. Can I get a commitment from SBS to eliminate the personal guarantees that are associated with these loans? Well, I, I certainly understand where you're coming from and, and the administration and, and SBS certainly share your concern about you know, the burdens placed on all small businesses. And, and we're certainly doing everything we can to help them recover uh, from the pandemic. Um, I, you know, I think when it comes to, to loans themselves, it's a little outside my expertise on, on how this works. I think sometimes the underwriter or the funder of the loans uh, requires a personal guarantee. So I'm not sure that's within the city's authority to remove that. Uh, but it's certainly something we're, we're happy to look into further and continue talking to you and the council about it. That would be great, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Sure. 
for the reason that we don't want to give a small business another reason not to comply for fear of. It's hard enough to stay in business, let alone put more uh, debt that they will be personally guaranteed for, they will be personally guaranteed with their homes and other assets uh, in a business that is currently struggling, as we are aware. And, uh, as Council Member Kalos mentioned earlier in his testimony, in his opening statement of the number of vacancies, our businesses are struggling. Small businesses, micro, micro businesses, mom and pop shops, our commercial car drugs will never be the same again. Uh, we've accepted that. And whatever that new reality will be, we'll just have to work uh, to shape it into a more productive uh, shopping experience. So my concerns uh, are those that I hear from our small businesses that taking on further debt, which um, puts their liabilities on other assets is a huge concern for them in this country. So I, I look forward to working with you on that. Does SBS help small businesses when they're sued uh, for AD non-compliance? Uh, I know that you have in-house legal services is there anything that you currently do for those businesses when they are sued? So while we do have legal services to help businesses, it's not, it's certainly not around litigation, right? So, so something like our commercial lease assistance program, we have, you know, um, you know, legal assistance in on contract essentially to provide that kind of assistance. And, and it's worth noting that in the commercial lease assistance program, there is mention both in our guide um, and there's, um, a, you know, around these issues. So if, if a business is having this type of challenge with the landlord and their lease, um, then this is something that they can address there. When it comes to litigation itself, I mean, that is, of course, is, you know, is a, something that's happening between private parties and essentially this empowering accessibility tool and the website that was created was was kind of with that in mind that the city, we are not, right, we are not the enforcement entity since this is a federal law. We are not party to the lawsuit and, and, it's, and it's not, um, you know, it's not typical that we'd be involved in that uh, litigation anyway. So our, what our recommendation and so if you go to this website at uh, businessaccessibility.nyc, it walks a business through um, the five or, six, five or six steps that they should take immediately upon receiving notice of litigation so that they can respond quickly, they can inform their insurance company, um, they can get private counsel. Um, and, and again, this is in 12 languages, but it, you know, it really kind of provides the, those, the steps they should take um, in, in order to you know, not ignore the lawsuit um, for sure, but also to uh, take steps uh, necessary. Uh, to address the situation. Thank you. And that's actually the concern. Uh, first, they're not aware of the uh, ADA uh, compliance. They find out, uh, typically in New York City, we find out that we're not in compliance through some form of violation. Uh, but in this regard, where they're finding out through a lawsuit, which would mean that they would have to hire their own attorneys to first defend or respond to the uh, lawsuit, and then seek to make either the necessary um, improvements to their establishment and settle the lawsuit. Money with which they don't have, especially in this climate. And as you heard in my uh, opening statement that uh, New, York, uh, New York is second in the country uh, with lawsuits involving ADA compliance. And I'll, just alone in January of 2021, 1100 Title III ADA related cases were filed. The highest number of cases ever in a single month. I'm concerned, uh, as we also heard from uh, Council Member Kalos, that you know, these, these small businesses, which are struggling today and certainly would love to comply with ADA compliance and open up their uh, stores and uh, providing the services and products that. Oh, I think you quoted a million New Yorkers uh, that currently are disabled, uh, let alone uh, tourists. Uh, that would open up the opportunity to do additional business. And I, we welcome any business. How do we get ahead of this? You know, it's a, it's a good question. And I, you know, I, I really, we, you know, personally and, and, and certainly our agency in the city share your concern in this. I, I, I um, you know, I get, you know, as, as much as, um, you know, we've all been aware for, of ADA for a long time since it was passed into law, certainly that, you know, I give a lot of credit to the, the bid community, certainly in bringing this to our attention um, around sort of, uh, you know, some of the lawsuits that were occurring. And, and, 
and it's a tough issue. It's something we we should we definitely want to continue to work with you on. But I, I you know that's why you know we you know SBS made this grant to the Bit Association to fund exactly the resource that they told us they needed, right? And so um, our thought here is that since as you said, building awareness is really so critical to this. So that business knows about their responsibilities, both you know while they're opening, while they're operating, if they if they face a lawsuit. So you know, building awareness among small businesses is really critical with this. So I think that resource, that business accessibility, that NYC is something we can continue to push, work with the council to push our bids, our chambers, our other community partners so that, you know, that, that there is the awareness and that there is the ability to comply uh, with ADA before there are, uh, before there's private litigation. Um, Stephanie, is, are any of the colleagues looking to ask questions of Deputy Commissioner Backer? At this time, I don't see any hands hands raised. Now that uh, she took that off, Rosenthal, uh, Council Member Rosenthal, I know that uh, worked really hard on this. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, you know, when we, when we look, do you, can you explain the difference between the compliance under the federal, city, and state ADA requirements, or at least the city versus the state, and then the federal requirements, are they more string, stringent in the city? You know, that there's probably, I'm gonna ask uh, Ed Friedman um, to step in and help me with that one. Hi, thank you, Chair John, for the question. So as you noted, there are different layers. So there's the federal ADA, there's the state human rights law, the city human rights law, and also the city's building code. So in many ways, the, the city and state laws do go above the ADA requirements. The interesting thing with regards to these lawsuits is chapter 11 of the building code is only triggered when work is being done. Whereas the ADA has barrier removal requirements that um, require the business to continually remove barriers even if there's no work being done. Uh, so there are differences uh, with the various standards, but they all work in tandem to uh, make sure that um, businesses are compliant with accessibility mandates. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Um, do we offer a time to cure on these violations of non-compliance when uh, we are aware? Do we give these small businesses an opportunity to correct um, before there's even a lawsuit? Or, this, or do they receive a fine and a violation when they're not compliant? You wanna go ahead, Ed? Sure, um, thank you, uh, Chair Jonai. So if you're referring to the ADA, there is no notice and cure uh, provision right now. As uh, Commissioner Backer noted, we don't enforce the ADA. So that is a matter between uh, the Department of Justice and the person making the complaint. Uh, with regards to the building code, um, if the work is being done and uh, the, there is trigger chapter 11 of the building code that there is a potential for fines, but that's different than the ADA. Thank you. Maybe um, Phil Monaco can answer that uh, for the building department. Are we given a small business an opportunity to cure and correct, or when you realize that there is a violation, non compliance of ADA, uh, is it uh, associated with a violation of the fine? Well, Phil is also with them a PD, but I don't know, Phil, if you had another <laughs> stab at that. Well, I, I was I was just going to reemphasize what uh, what Ed said. That's that's correct. So when it's triggered, the building department will uh, come in and the potential violation. Um, you know, it's uh, it's definitely possible under Chapter Eleven. And so that's the only major difference as far as enforcement goes. Does anybody know what those fines are for uh, non-compliance of something such as a a ramp or? a step or a storefront that doesn't have the width of a door uh, to comply or what the, do you know what the structure of those fines and for those violations are? Uh, even though I did work at DOB for a while, it's been a few years, so I'd be hesitant to, uh, to say they do vary. That's what I would say, but DOB would probably be better prepared to answer that question. We have anybody from DOB with us, uh, Stephanie? We do not. Be interesting to know what those fines are. I just I'm painting the worst picture possible. Not only uh, are these small businesses being hit with lawsuits um, that will require settlement, um, but then in addition, the work that needs to be done to comply. And in addition to that, a fine 
from the city of New York for the Department of Buildings for not complying to begin with. I just want to clarify, Chair, that again, the fines that you're referring to regarding the city would be if the work is being done uh, with the building code. They're not the same as the ADA um, situations. Thank you for that clarification. And it could be worth also noting, Chair Joe and I, that you know, certainly with something like Open Restaurants, right, a program that certainly the city's been yeah. working on to help um you know the businesses recover from the pandemic that we, we ha there have no fines have been issued on that there has been very much exactly what you're what you're mentioning essentially a, a warning and an educational process uh, and no no fines have been issued at this point uh, under that program for ada issues you brought up a great point on the open uh, streets and sidewalks for a particular restaurant industry um when they submit their drawings do they have to be ada compliant is that part of the requirement I, I think. I think uh, deputy. Sorry, I, I mute and then instinctively, and then I can't unmute. Um, sorry. So, uh, well, Ed, you're welcome to jump in here. But so, yeah, again, I think you know there is a requirement that there is compliant. But I, at this point, um, the way open restaurants is work, you know, is more of a self-certification process. They are not sort of submitting drawings as might be typical under the previous, um, you know, sidewalk cafe uh, regime. So they are. Um, you know, complying with sort of the, the requirements as outlined by DOT uh, on their website. And so they, they need to sort of pre-certify uh, that they're following those. And, and Ed, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I'll jump in as well to say, so yes, there are accessibility requirements and, and we do um, have a fact sheet on our website that anyone can take a look at uh, with those um, standards in place. Thank are you aware of any lawsuits that have been filed against restaurants that have participated in the uh, Open Street program? I'm not aware of any. It would be interesting. I am not either. Well, I want to thank you um, for participating. I have one last question, and I don't know if there's anyone here from Landmarks that can answer. Um, I might be able to. There isn't, but I might be able to handle it. So we know that Landmarks, um, for those properties that, are, uh, that have the status of Landmarks, Repairs uh, and alterations are not that easily easily achieved. You know, that it requires a process before you can even begin the work. Uh, I've heard of issues with landmarks not approving or delaying and further creating a bigger liability on these small businesses. When we think of you know landmarks, we don't often think of a storefront. It is a part of the landmark process, and perhaps. The material that's needed uh, or the, the, the size uh, could not allow them to comply, uh, as well as the approval of land. Do you know any such issues, uh, Deputy? Well, so, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And I, you know, and I, even though they couldn't be here today, I you know, have a decent understanding of, of how this works. And I think there is a, the, some misinformation at times about the landmarks law and, and complying with it. And, and, and I'm sure Wellington can answer this question too when it's his turn as, as he sits on the commission. Um, but, you know, you know, LPC believes historic buildings can and should be made accessible to all. And the commission has a long history of approving alterations to make historic buildings accessible. Um, so, you know, through careful planning and sensitive design, there's, you know, a way to eliminate the physical barriers and entry and use of the building, but still complying with the landmarks law. So um, I do know in 2019, um, LPC made some adjustments to their rules to make approvals of these things a little more streamlined and done at the staff level. Um, so I, the, the numbers I have here is that, um, you know, between 2015 and 2021, um, that LPC reviewed 209 applications at the staff level for alterations to provide barrier-free access. Um, and all, um, all applications uh, were um, completed and approved at the staff level review. And then in addition, the full commission has reviewed 142 applications and voted to approve all of them. Thank you for that information. Sure. Uh, do you know what the time delay is for the approval process? You mentioned 142 have actually gone through the full process. Um, I don't know the specifics on time, but again, I, I, you know, I think that's what LPC was doing in 2019 was attempting to shorten the time essentially by allowing more of these uh, applications be, to be reviewed by staff instead of to, at the full commission level. So uh, our goal there is you know, certainly to streamline um, these types of processes while still um, ensuring compliance with both landmarks as well as ADA. Um, I believe 
uh, we have a question from uh, Council Member Brooks Powers. Is that correct, uh, Stephanie? Yes, thank you. Hi, Hi good um, morning to you. I just had two really brief questions. Um, I just wanted to understand um, better if SBS had been working collaboratively um, with the mayor's office for people with disabilities, um, just in terms of the education piece, making sure that um, it is first and um, just making sure that we are looking to work collaboratively in this space. So that's the first question. Sure, yeah, and no, I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I can say I've gotten to know Ed quite well because we do work quite closely with MOPD. And so, um, you know, I touched on this in my testimony, but um, the, essentially the grant that, that my team and neighborhood development provided to the BID Association and Public Policy Lab, um, we, you know, essentially we received an application for the grant outlining this need. We pulled an MOPD to ensure they had a seat at the table so that these, these materials, they're on businessaccessibility.nyc, were created collaboratively. So we had, you know, the business community and their voice via the bids as well as the MOPD uh, at the table and creating them. So not only do the materials really represent, uh, you know, sort of that collaboration, um, then also we got um, the former um, general counsel of MOPD has done a training for not only uh, members of SBS's staff, um, the compliance advisors and the small business advocates, but also for um, all of the bids um, so that everyone was aware of these resources and knew, uh, you know, knew how to speak about them if and when asked and, and so that they could proactively um, help businesses comply. Did you have another question? Yeah. I did. I was trying to get back <laughs> on mute. Thank you. And, um, you know, thank you, Chair, for also um, talking about the, the status and the state of our small businesses. Um, and just being someone who's super sensitive to small businesses as well as um, our MWBEs, as well. I just wanted to understand a little bit more in terms of the outreach that has been um, done in those spaces um, as well as you are exploring this, uh, this change and what the impact is going to be on them. Um, I'd like to understand in light of the current pandemic, because I know in particular, like my district, for example, has been really devastated by the pandemic and we've seen some closures already. Is this going to bring any um, the implementation of this? How, how is it going to impact those businesses? Um. I'm sorry, I may have missed the, the first part of your question, but when you said spaces, you're talking about like for the accessibility, like in terms of the collaboration that you speak of. Um, and I know you mentioned that you've worked with like bids and um, some of the merchants, but I wanted to know more pointedly in terms of like the MWBEs um, and small businesses, especially in the outer boroughs, like what has that level of engagement been? Sure. Sorry. So yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, of course, you know, SBS as 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 with many of the agencies have had to respond to the pandemic and move some of our services and programs um, to to an online or virtual format. Um, so I, a couple of things. Obviously, we you know we've set up the small business hotline that certainly all businesses can access. Um, and we've, we've moved our, some of our compliance advisor work um, to a virtual, so businesses um, can have virtual compliance consultations to ensure that they are, um, you know, not only aware of what their requirements are under, you know, ADA or, or other regulations and, and, and rules, um, but also they could be aware of, right, MWBE certification or any number of, of sort of services and programs SBS offers. I think um, in your particular district, um, you know, a good example where we work quite closely with, um, you know, with REMA, the Rockaways Merchant Association and RDRC. So while they're not a bid, they are, we, you know, we more or less treat them. They're both grantees of ours. We, we, we just recently made, um, you know, I think they're in their second of a three-year grant for both organizations, as well as we made a, a recent COVID recovery grant to both organizations. So, you know, we work closely with them as well as RBA uh, further on the peninsula. 
you know, essentially serve that, you know, they're in the field when we can't be right and they have access to all of this information and, and they are, you know, as part of our grant as grantees of ours, they essentially participate in a monthly training, a cohort based training where they are learning kind of repeatedly all of the services that SBS offers and other agencies offer so that they can make those connections and make those referrals to us. Thank no, you. that's great. Sorry. I was going to say that's great. Thank you. I'm glad that you are connecting with Rima um, and hope that you're also connecting with groups such as like Marls and um, the Black Resource Network um, that are also doing some great work on the ground in the outer boroughs as well. So I definitely encourage you to, um, if you have not already, work with those partners. Definitely. Too. Yeah, we'll be. I'll be sure to. Um, you know, I'd look. Uh, there's there's a lot of organizations we work with, but uh, I'll make sure that those are on our our outreach list. And if not, we'll we'll make sure you can help us make a connection. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Powers, for not only the question but also uh, groups uh, that SBS can further work and educate and help bring awareness. To this. I see that we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez and Council Member Perkins. I don't have any more questions, so I'm going to turn it over to the committee council. I'm not sure if the other members have any questions for the administration. Thank you, Chair. Um, seeing no council member hands raised, I will now turn to public testimony. Uh, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I would like to now welcome Wellington Chen, followed by Jessica Walker, and then Kathleen Riley. Wellington? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, uh, Chair Jonai, members of the New York City Council. My name is Wellington Chen, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the New York City Bid Association. I'm also the executive director of the Chinatown Partnership, and thank you for holding this hearing today. The bid association represents all the 76 individual bids throughout the city that serves as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors and neighborhood public spaces. Our mission has always been to support the almost 100,000 local businesses we serve, to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe, and to bring uh, prosperity to our communities. Never has our work been more vital and essential than it has been during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are pleased to present the testimony today on behalf of, the, of accessibility for small business. The NYC Bid Association has been working on this issue for years in an attempt to help small businesses to comply with, with ADA requirements. As you know, many small businesses are either unaware of the ADA requirements or unable to bear the cost of upgrading their facilities to meet the necessary standards. There have, there have been several costly lawsuits against businesses that have, been, that have hurt small businesses that simply do not know how or are not able to comply with this law. We do appreciate the importance of accessibility and want to help find solution to this challenge. The Department of Small Business Services, SBS, has always been a, a great partner to us and small businesses on this issue. Several years ago, we worked with SBS and Public Policy Lab to produce a report on this issue and to create a website that would help small businesses under, to understand and comply with the relevant laws. That website, as mentioned before, businessaccessibility.nyc, is still live and available today with information in multiple languages. Uh, however, we do recognize that it's not enough to tackle this uh, important issue alone and why we appreciate the City Council is trying to help. We generally support both bills being considered today, Intro 2097 and 2110. Uh, intro 2097 will require the City to establish the types of financial programs to, that will actually help small businesses and property owners to undergo the costly construction projects needed to reach ADA compliance. However, it may be difficult to get landlords and tenants to agree on a rent reduction in order to receive a grant. Often, we see the cost and responsibility of such projects put entirely onto tenants. 
Intro 2110 will require SBS to continue and build upon their work to educate businesses about this law and their need, the need for compliance. However, it is very critical to reach businesses with education before they sign a lease. Many problems arise when a business signs a lease, not realizing the storefront is not compliant and the cost of coming into compliance. We certainly support the intents of both of these bills and thank Council Member Kalos for introducing them. We look forward to working with the City Council, SBS, and property owners and tenants to help resolve these issues moving forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your hard work and commitment to small businesses and the 76 bids throughout New York City. I am grateful to you as uh, they are and uh, how small businesses are. And thank you for working so hard on this issue, uh, which is not often discussed or talked about. We are grateful to you for helping educate and bring awareness uh, to all those that are in business and must be compliant. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wellington. Next, we'll be hearing from Jessica Walker, followed by Kathleen Riley. Jessica? Hi, good morning. Uh, I am Jessica Walker, the president and CEO of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. We're a nonprofit organization that represents and supports the business community across the borough. And as you can imagine, our current focus is squarely on accelerating New York City's economic recovery in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, to that end, I do want to thank you for holding a hearing on this important topic. Uh, and before I, I jump in, I just wanted to uh, say hello to all council members, but especially to the new council member, Brooks Powers. Uh, look forward to working with you. Um, so ADA laws are absolutely critical. Um, but they are absolutely being abused by lawyers who are trying to make an easy buck. And most of the complaints that we're seeing uh, against businesses right now are not driven by advocates, but by lawyers. And this is actually reminiscent, uh, I'm sure this, people on this committee will remember the, the accessory signage, signage issue we saw a few years ago when people were calling 311 to complain about signs being out of compliance all of a sudden. And of course, many people believe that that sudden spike in calls was driven by the sign makers who were looking to boost their business. Um, we think that the same type of thing uh, is happening here. Um, unfortunately, building owners often bury uh, in the commercial leases that the ADA liability falls squarely on their business, the business tenants. And so we have seen firsthand, one of our small business members found this out the hard way. He was forced, it's a, it's a boutique flower shop um, so, you know, they, they do good, they do, they do pretty well in terms of revenue, but, um, you know, this is certainly not a multi-million dollar business. Uh, and they were forced to retain a lawyer, a very costly lawyer, uh, one that he pr pretty much probably couldn't afford to address one of these complaints. And it really did almost put, put him out of business. Um, I think the two bills being considered today are well-intentioned, but may not be workable for a few reasons, but um, I do think that something that was mentioned is really critical, and that is that there, there should be a cure period where business owners are notified and given the time to correct the issue. Um, I think that's, that's really key. And short of that, because I do understand that there are, uh, you were talking about who has jurisdiction here, but short of that, perhaps the Department of Consumer Affairs and Workforce Protections uh, could be allowed to mediate some of these complaints. I think that that would be helpful in terms of uh, disincentivizing lawyers from making excessive complaints, uh, but all the while, of course, making sure that our city is more accessible, which I think is the goal for, for everyone here. Um, what we obviously do not want is for small businesses to have to close because the cost uh, of, of you know, getting towards accessibility is so great. Uh, so happy to, to chat more about that, uh, but again, this is an important issue and, and I appreciate you taking it up today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Thank you personally for all the work, for the relationship that we have. I think we have a lot more to do, especially around this. Overall, it's about protecting those businesses and protecting uh, those that uh, that have disabilities, that make sure that they have the accessibility, quality of life that they should enjoy and benefit from. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Go ahead, Chair. You know, Sorry. I, you know uh, Jessica, you said that maybe these bills don't go far enough. Is there any thoughts uh, as to what we can do? And that's why these hearings are so important. Uh, 
anything specific that resonates with you that we could help shape this into a better law or something that we may not be aware of? Well, I, I think, you know, the fund in particular, it doesn't take away that disincentive. You're, you're creating a fund to pay the lawyers. <laughs> so it's not going to, you know, the excessive uh, complaints, which are not coming from the right place. It's just, uh, it's not going to fix the problem. And, uh, you know, it, it alleviates, it takes that, the, the burden off of the small business owner, but then it puts it on taxpayers. And so it's not really solving the problem. I really do think that, that moving towards a cure period is where we want to get to because, um, we do want the streets to be accessible. We do want a city that is accessible. Uh, but like I said, it has to be done in a way that's, that's not um, harming small businesses who have to pay lawyers fees. It, it's just not productive. Anything else that you can uh, add to that, uh, Jessica? Um, well, like I said, I do think that, that there might be ways to, to mediate. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to also, you know, I'm learning more about the issue myself. So if we do need to go to the federal government to, to advocate for change, change, I'm always happy to, to be a part of that. But, uh, but I, I do think that this is a real threat. Um, and potentially, you know, once we do come out of COVID, where we're going to see a lot of businesses with, with a lot of debt, uh, that if this does start up again, uh, with all of these complaints, it could be a real, a really big problem. So we talk about if you were fortunate enough to be a small business that survived the pandemic and crisis, now you can have the final nail in your coffin, which could be a lawsuit, as you heard in my opening statement, uh, the average of which was a $16,000 settlement uh, that these businesses just don't have. Uh, don't have in, addition, in addition to the money that they would need to actually do the work so that their establishments are in compliance. Um, I agree with you. Maybe a cap on uh, the attorney fees would be the way to do that. Uh, uh, you know, that incentive. I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know if that's possible um, or what that would require. But I do think that again, that disincentive. Um, you know, maybe that is a way to something to look at. Thank you. I'm looking forward to speaking to you and continue this conversation. God Thank bless you. you for the work that you do. Thank you, Jessica. And last, we'll be calling Kathleen Riley. Kathleen? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association. Um, and thank you so much to the Small Business Committee, Chair Jonai, for holding today's hearing, and to Councilmember Kalos and the co sponsors for sponsoring intros 2097 and 2110. Um, overall, the legislation has our support. Accessibility and EDA compliance are so important to us and to the city. And helping businesses meet that standard through education and resources is a helpful way for the city to get involved. On the resources front, the legislation provides for some combination of grants, loans, and in-kind materials and services. From our perspective, grants and in-kind services or materials would be more preferable and loans would be less preferable. As I'm sure you all know, due to COVID, restaurant operators are on very precarious financial footing Many are already taking out significant debt trying to survive. So whether that's government debt, debt to a landlord, personal debt, it's a very common situation for our operators. And as council member Jonai uh, very correctly pointed out earlier, personally guaranteed loans in particular are very risky for operators to take on at this time. So with that in mind, we'd hope that this program could be funded in such a way that grants and in-kind offerings are widely available um, and, and loans would be uh, sort of the referable resort. Um, on the final point of that, of that first piece, which may require a landlord and tenant to agree to a rent decrease as a condition for receiving assistance from the city. Um, as it was previously mentioned, we, are, we are totally agree. We see the intent and we see the rationale that if the city is paying for a permanent upgrade to the storefront, it would presumably raise the value of that storefront to the property owner. But if the lease agreement places the onus on the tenant to make that kind of improvement or maintain that kind of uh, accessibility, then the various incentives just might not play out as intended. So a landlord might not feel inclined to lower the rent. And then if that prevents the improvement from taking place, then that's an issue, um, especially in the current sort of shaky rental landscape that we're seeing. Tenants may owe significant back rent or they may have very recently established a new lower rent lease. Um, both of those cases may make it so that a landlord does not want to lower it again. So we're uncertain about how that particular requirement could play out. 
of course, for our restaurant operators, lower rent is good for them, um, but we just want to flag that as a point that could potentially be a stumbling block. And if we do see landlords frequently blocking upgrades because they don't want to lower the rent, we would like to prioritize getting the accessibility upgrade done uh, anyway. On the education front, we're very supportive of increasing the efforts of SBS to inform restaurants and all small businesses about ADA compliance and specifically to tailor those materials to businesses who are in the midst of lawsuits. As everyone has already mentioned um, the sort of nuisance lawsuits or lot are not actually coming from, from uh, ADA advocates are very prevalent. Um, and in that vein, we are also aware of certain cutting edge or mostly untested areas of ADA litigation. Uh, one example being businesses being sued because their gift cards don't have braille. Um, so it's not that we can necessarily expect SBS to give authoritative answers on those topics, but um, we would ask that they stay current on the frontiers of ADA litigation so that they're best positioned to educate restaurants about obligations and potential risks there. So to wrap up, we are very supportive of the intent. We're very supportive of any city effort to help improve accessibility and improve businesses' ability to comply with the ADA requirements. Um, and we are looking forward to an ongoing collaboration on this topic with all of you. Thank you. Kathleen, uh, thank you for the work that we've done together in your partnership. I'm grateful to your input and contribution. Do you see, do you know your industry uh, has been a target of these lawsuits? Have you heard any of the horror stories that I've been exposed to? Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have specific um, examples off the top of my head just because the horror of COVID has been so much more recent and fresh, but definitely pre-COVID especially, um, we would hear about people being hit with these nuisance lawsuits frequently. And the most recent ones, like the example I gave um, earlier, were areas that are less obvious, like things, with, things about a ramp or physical uh, accommodations. I think people have a better sense of, they're more familiar with it. Um, but things around uh, gift cards or definitely digital accommodations is a big one that had been that some people had been hit with in the last few years. Um, so I think that those are areas where people really do need a lot more education because the complaints are happening and we want to protect people as well as make sure, of course, that their their facilities are accessible to everyone. Elaborate on the digital. Uh, I, I'm not following. Um, so like your website has to be accessible. So I think that in includes, um, for example, there's software that reads things out loud to someone who may be visually impaired. So it basically like if your, if your backend infrastructure did not accommodate tools that would make a website accessible, um, then you could run into an issue there. But like, as I'm sure you would imagine, a lot of small business operators um, make their own websites. They're maybe not very sophisticated. So that's, I think, where you were seeing a lot of friction because they either weren't aware or didn't have the wherewithal to get their web pages up to snuff. So we were we were hearing about um, complaints within that vein. So you're saying you heard of complaints of a lawsuit that was filed because the website was not accessible to those that suffered from visual or hearing impaired. Um, yes. Yes, so absolutely. Aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's why these hearings are so important and participants of uh, industries and stakeholders mean so much. Now we'll have to look at that as well. Uh, I was not aware of that uh, or of that lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. We'll have to circle back to you on that one. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kathleen. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. I will now turn it over to Chair Joni to offer any closing remarks. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Jones. And uh, I wanna thank all those that uh, participated in today's hearing. Certainly I learned more uh, and uh, I'll continue to do more research working with the council staff and. Uh, uh, the committee our council on um, determining what actions should be taken as we look to perfect this bill and make it one that uh, helps benefit society as a whole. 
protecting those with disabilities as well as our small businesses and making sure that they just don't become a target of lawsuits that are income generating for attorneys. So I am grateful. Thank you all. And again, thank you, uh, Ms. Jones, for the excellent work and to all those that testified. This hearing is now finished.